started. Um, Dr. Jane Lipscomb is our first uh, presenter. She is a re retired professor from the University of Maryland Schools of Nursing and Medicine and director of the Center for Community-Based Engagement and Learning in June 2017. During her 40-year career, she conducted research into the prevention of occupational injuries and illness uh, with a focus on the healthcare and social service workplace. For the last 25 years, her research focused on participation interventions, and she's currently the principal of At Prevention at Work. Um, she also provides expert testimony in federal OSHA enforcement cases involving the hazard of workplace violence. She's the co-chair of the Maryland Nurses Association Subcommittee on Workplace Violence. Um, prior to joining the faculty, she spent three years as a senior scientist in the office of the director of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and five years at the University of California's um, San Francisco School of Nursing as an assistant professor and director of the graduate program in occupational health nursing. I'm thrilled to have Jane come and present for us um, all the way from the East Coast. So welcome, Jane, and we have you start. Thank you. <laughs> clear to me how many of you actually are from health care. So how about anybody who doesn't work in health care? Can you raise your hand? Wow. So I saw fruit industries. Well, so what industries are you from if you're not from health care? Um, manufacturing, furniture. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> state government in Oregon. Well, I'm particularly happy that you're here today because um, I'm going to make a public promise that um, I've got a fair amount of time this morning, so I'm planning on stopping at 9 so we can actually have some genuine discussion, and I'd love to hear your perspective because you were really out there in the trenches, and what you're doing in that service has a lot of implications for those that are you know, sort of uh, further up, I guess, in the healthcare delivery chain. Yeah. yeah. So, um, again, welcome. Um, this is my first time ever in Spokane, and I'm very impressed, especially with this great weather we're having here. Um, as um, Nancy said, um, I've spent, wow, most of my career doing um, health and safety, mostly research and policy work. I am a nurse by background, but um, what I've taught and where my expertise is really in public health, so I don't really do anything clinically per se. Um, but just by way of background, when I think about um, how I became um, interested in, uh, decided to focus my career on the topic of workplace violence, wasn't actually because I was a clinical nurse and got 
assaulted. Um, thinking back when I was um, living in California in the late 80s, I got um, a call late at night to, to learn that one of my dearest um, childhood friends was murdered while she was at work. Um, she actually was a nurse and had, in fact, gone into occupational health and safety, but um, she happened to be working on Sunday, as many of us do, to catch up on the week's work, and was um, raped and murdered when she was in her parking lot in the afternoon. So that was um, what is referred to in the field as sort of type one violence, where there is a, a crime that is committed by an outsider, and you happen to be at work. Um, at that point in time. And then sort of more poignantly, when I was um, at the University of California in San Francisco in the early 90s, um, I was beginning to do um, some research on the topic and had begun to start writing about it. And I was contacted by two physicians from Napa State Hospital, um, one of the forensic state hospitals um, in, in the state of California. And they had, you know, this was before the days of the internet, they had learned that there was somebody at UCSF that was interested in this topic. And so they traveled from Napa to see me. And the two of them, one was the thoracic uh, physician, and I think the other one was a psychiatrist. And they both had been um, severely uh, beaten up by a patient at Napa State. And one of them you know, would have been killed had somebody not happened to come back through the hall to see if they had left something behind. And um, one of the physicians had lost his sight and one eye as a result. And, and I know this is being taped, um, but they, they were appealing to me because actually the Department of Health sort of was the more powerful of the state agencies. And so even though um, the Cal OSHA at the time did an investigation. Um, there wasn't the kind of you know remedy that there should have been. And again, this was you know decades ago. But again, it really impressed upon me the potential you know problem and the severity of it, and the fact that it's happening to physicians who you know often have more voice and um, are you know valued more in the healthcare worker hierarchy. Hierarchy was just pretty shocking to me. Um, Folks of you on the West Coast might remember that probably within the last decade, I think there was another death at Napa State Hospital, and it really was, you know, very upsetting to sort of see this whole thing being played out again. So anyway, that's that's my background, and since then I've had the privilege of, um, you know, getting to know thousands of healthcare workers who, um, you know, day in and day out, put their health and safety at risk because. They really, you know, care to um, be there day in and day out, um, often providing services to those that are sort of least valued in society. So, um, background. So, what I'm going to do is provide an overview for the day's work, and um, I really come with a national perspective. But I'm thrilled that the rest of the speakers are going to be able to talk about more of a uh, Northwest and, and California perspective because states of um, Washington and California are much further ahead of um, the nation on the topic of workplace violence prevention and health and safety in general. Um, so, so this is what I um, hope to accomplish by um, the end of this hour. And um, again, we'll leave time for you to share some of your experiences and observations on this. Um, Originally, Nancy asked me to talk about the research on the topic of workplace violence, and specifically, she said the intervention effectiveness research. And I sort of came back and said, you know, Nancy, there's not that much out there <laughs> because it's so hard to do this research. I myself was fortunate enough to have um, probably 10 years of NIOSH funding, and we, we did the type of work that needs to be done. But as outside researchers in healthcare, it's very, very difficult to impose yourself on a system and try to control conditions to allow you to do the kind of rigorous research that is needed to really you know, pr present the kind of evidence that um, lawmakers and, and administrators are looking for in terms of what they should be doing and what the impact will be. <clears throat> but I'll talk about what is known. So um, let me just start by saying, um, there's 
bunch of definitions of workplace violence out there. I usually refer to the NIOSH one, which is the first one on this slide, and um, the distinction between the NIOSH and the federal OSHA definitions are the NIOSH definition doesn't include harassment, intimidation. Um, that is a really important problem in all workplaces um, and in healthcare. Um, they're not immune from conflict that transpires across coworkers. But um, that is even more difficult in my experience to address and tackle. And so um, today I'm going to be focusing on what they call type two violence, which is violence that is perpetrated by patients or visitors or the public towards healthcare workers and not talking about um, conflict that goes on between and among coworkers. If in the discussion period you want to talk about that, um, you know, have opinions and have done work in that area. But today we're going to talk about patient on staff violence. So um, the other point to make about um, these definitions, definitions is that violence certainly isn't limited to physical injuries, that um, certainly the kind of verbal abuse that many workers experience on a day in and day out basis can be, you know, incredibly impactful. And sometimes I hear more impactful than, you know, a patient lashing out and, and hitting and bruising maybe a healthcare worker. The words can be very hurtful, especially when they have to return to you know, the next shift to care for the same patient. The other thing um, which I want to say around the topic of definition and um, is what I what what should not be included in the definition of workplace violence is that the violence has to be intentional. And I <coughs> healthcare workers, especially nurses, get caught up on this. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with colleagues that say, well, but they didn't they didn't intend, you know, they didn't mean to hit me. You know, this elderly patient has dementia. And we're not trying to stigmatize the mentally ill or um, substance abusing individuals. The problem is that a worker still gets injured, irrespective of the intent. So don't I don't want people to, you know, falsely make a distinction between that. So um, here is the typology that I was just referring to. So um, this was um, established by colleagues in the field, and here it's attributed to Cal OSHA, um, to, because workplace violence means so many different things to different people. And so um, many years ago in the 90s, um, <clears throat> there was some writing that was done to try to um, identify these different types, and the types are um, defined by who the perpetrator of the violence is. Um, and the motivation for this was that the interventions that one might design would be different if you're talking about, you know, type one violence, as I described my friend who was murdered in a parking lot, versus Type two, if you're, you know, working in an emergency room or in a behavioral health setting. So um, again, I'm talking about type two. <clears throat> um, type four, I haven't mentioned here, but you also are um, probably familiar with it when domestic violence spills over into the workplace. And again, different. You would think about different interventions depending upon the type. But at this point in my career, what I have come to understand is that um, <clears throat> if you work in a workplace that has a problem with one type of violence, chances are you probably are at risk for the other types of violence because it's an organization that doesn't really pay a lot of attention to health and safety. It probably has a very poor you know, safety culture anyway. So, um, So I'm going to just present <clears throat> a few slides that talks about um, the magnitude of the problem. And um, I was this set of slides that I have come from um, a document that Federal OSHA has published on their um, website. If you just Google OSHA and you put in workplace violence in hospitals, you come to this series of um, I think they call them e-tools that were uh, developed in 2015, and I was really incredibly fortunate to be um, hired as a consultant to work on that effort because it was an attempt to um, 
provide further non-regulatory guidance to employers about the problem. And one way in which um, this is done is by um, visiting workplaces that have best practices around the issue and then you know, describing those best practices in the form of cases. And so, um, in fact, and at the beginning of this project, OSHA um, reached out to me, the group that had responsibility for this contract, and said, you know, we want you to direct us to some places that have best practices. And I'm like, you know, I don't really know of anybody that's got best practices because frequently I get contacted when there's a problem. But um, it turns out, there are um, a number of health organizations that are really doing well, and um, and some of them I actually didn't know about. And it was an amazing experience to spend a day in a workplace where they were doing like all of the things that you've been talking about for decades. And um, they report, although it's not published because it's you know internal data that it really is making an impact. So. This, um, these slides were produced for that report. And again, um, at the end of this presentation, I have um, the link to that website. But so what I wanna show you here is just how big the problem is in healthcare. And that doesn't mean it's not an issue in industries in which others of you work. Um, it also should be noted that there's a huge problem of underreporting of even type two violence when it comes to type three, meaning coworker conflict. I mean, that stuff just doesn't see the light of day other than sort of in coffee rooms. Um, so, but healthcare, you know, stands out by um, fourfold over other industries. So um, this slide is busy, but what I just want to direct your attention to is the longer of the bars. So this is looking at um, non-fatal workplace violence in healthcare um, specifically and it actually shows what's known from the three federal databases that collect information on this. And let's see, so here, I mean, you can just see that in nursing and residential care facilities, the problem is the largest. There's hospitals and then there's, oops, sorry, overall. So obviously a lot of uh, focus is and should be on those um, settings. So this is um, another slide, and this is actually looking at by occupation again, just in um, in healthcare, um, and not surprising, the the highest prevalence here is is in psychiatric AIDS. Now, I haven't taken the time to go back and ask the contractors why they divided the <clears throat> the psychiatric technicians from the AIDS. In a lot of the behavioral health hospitals I work in, they don't make that distinction. So I think they probably can be grouped. And, and they're at you know, tremendous risk. Um, some of the work that I've been doing that um, Nancy included in the introduction is um, with Federal OSHA. And Federal OSHA is now using their power under the general duty clause to cite employers when they get a complaint for the most part. If they're not doing you know, what they should be doing in terms of um, preventing workplace violence. And um, you know, it's not unusual for a quarter of these employees, the mental health techs, to be out for a number of days with a uh, violence-related injury. I mean, it's hugely expensive. And again, what, is, what does that do to the workforce? And, and by extension, the kind of care that they're able to provide to you know, a very needy population. So um, a little bit now um, about what we know from the research. Um, again, you all know from your own experience that this is a really common problem. Um, when studies have been done and actually reviews of individual studies have been done, these are the estimates. So um, uh, Lisa Pompey, who's um, in Texas, has done some really great work and publications around the topic. And so I'd say, you know, the best estimates overall come from her work. And you can see as the um, as the outcome becomes, you know, more severe with a physical assault, at least in terms of what you can see from it, 
Um, the prevalence ranges anywhere from 2 to 32 percent. Again, this is across all settings. Um, another um, a group of researchers from the University of Minnesota um, have done a lot of um, population-based surveys of nurses in the state of Minnesota, and they've documented the prevalence of workplace violence, but they've also done a number of studies looking at among those nurses that have been assaulted, um, what are their risk factors. And um, again, not surprisingly, what she points out is um, you know, high levels of stress, um, an expectation that assault is part of the job, which I think relates back to that point I made about, um, you know, if you don't really prioritize health and safety and consider workplace violence part of a job, you know, you're not going to do a lot to protect your workers. Um, no action taken in response to an assault that placed workers at increased risk of further assaults and low morale. Um, and then just finally, the third piece of data that um, sort of hard to get your mind around, but there was um, a study that was published in 2017 that looked at the emergency department. And this was their estimate of the number of violent patients per patient encounter. Um, so again, I, unfortunately, we're going to be hearing a lot more about the emergency department um, this morning. <coughs> So actually, we know a fair amount about um, what is responsible for violence in healthcare, and um, this publication I think goes back to 1996, when NIOSH, you know, published some guidance with this set of um, risk factors. And I think I think it's a generic list, and I think at one point in time I categorized them into these four headings here. Um, and I think actually I added the, the safety culture factors because they're so important. Um, you know, in my experience in, um, in the year 2000, we started doing a big um, intervention study across New York State, and um, we worked with um, four psychiatric inpatient hospitals. And um, even though you were dealing with the same system and the same policies at the state level, management really mattered a lot. So um, if your management really doesn't um, invest in health and safety and really provide leadership and sort of put their money where their mouth is in terms of investing in health and safety, you know, chances are you're <coughs> not going to be able to reduce the problem of workplace violence like you could if you were working in a more um, you know, enlightened unit or, or institution. So uh, I can't say enough about the importance of uh, management commitment. And then hand in hand with that goes real employee engagement. Um, those of us who have been reared in the theories of health and safety know how important it is for frontline workers to be um, really, really active from the get-go in terms of looking at how to prevent various types of hazards. But I think when it comes to the hazard of workplace violence, it's, it's the most critical because um, these mental health techs that are at such great risk, I mean, many of them know these patients that they work with in long-term care or in a behavioral health hospital much better than the clinicians that are prescribing their medicines and changing them you know, every six weeks. And if you don't tap that expertise, you are missing a huge you know, opportunity to really curb the violence that might be directed towards healthcare workers and other patients. But also, it, you know, it, it potentially impacts the clinical care. So again, genuine employee engagement in the form of um, you know, a real health and safety committee, I think is absolutely critical. So then um, client factors, um, workplace violence is increasing in healthcare. And I think there's not a lot of debate about the fact that the increasing um, use of, of drugs and the funneling of those individuals through the healthcare system you know, is a big contributor. Um, 
we live in a more violent um, society. There certainly have been, continued to be um, cutbacks in terms of mental health services. We hear about it every time that there is some sort of you know, mass shooting. So, um, and then the whole issue of firearms. Um, so the, then looking at that third category, um, in healthcare, again, the, the organizational factors, which are often referred to as administrative controls, are really, really important. Um, working alone, I'll talk a little bit more about that because we've done a lot of work um, in, in community settings. Um, working understaffed, something I'd like to um, talk about with those of you that work in healthcare. The staffing's critical. And um, it's something that, um, I don't know about in the state of California and, and in Washington, that but in the federal go government, up until recently, they've been very hesitant to address staffing and health care because, again, they see that as a health department issue, but it is <coughs> critical. I mean, there's no way you can be safe if you don't have adequate state staff to respond to a patient's request to use a bathroom when the bathrooms are locked. You know, and so you're asking patients to wait 15 minutes before they can use the facilities. I mean, it's just, it's so common sense. But in my experience, there are many organizations that basically staff to the minimums. Um, training is, is really important, um, but training is, necessary but not sufficient in and of itself and that is often the response to an inc incident of workplace violence you know well, we'll just they need more training or an individual worker didn't use the training correctly that they had been offered um, and then finally there's a whole group of, of environmental factors which um, are sort of the low-hanging fruit in healthcare. Um, because you cannot engineer out the problem of a potentially violent patient like you might do in a correctional facility where you basically you know, separate the individual, the exposure from the staff. In healthcare, you can't do that. You're there to deliver care and very intimate care. So um, you want to make sure, though, that the environment does not provide additional opportunities for staff to get injured. You, you, you know, don't want to have blind areas where a staff member could be trapped by a patient. You don't want to have objects that are um, sitting on a nurse's station desk that can be used as a weapon, and it happens all the time in certain settings. So I want to um, make a distinction or talk a little bit about um, the different types of settings in healthcare and social assistance and how, in my experience, um, the risk varies across these types of settings. Um, Federal OSHA in um, 1996 first issued, issued a set of guidelines that are really excellent that talk about addressing the problem of workplace violence in healthcare and social assistance workplaces. And it, um, the guidelines are developed around sort of the, the basic principles of a health and safety management system. Um, in 2015, OSHA revised the guidelines and they didn't change the basic <coughs> program structure, but what they did was they um, offered additional guidance in terms of the different types of settings. So they um, specifically looked at, you know, how does a hospital differ from you know, someone who works in the field and their risk of workplace violence. So, um, I mean, if, so um, hospitals obviously have a lot more resources than, than some, for instance, um, red, residential treatment centers. For instance, um, I continue to bump up against the problem that small behavioral health hospitals don't have security personnel basically call the police when something happens. So, you know, thinking about these distinctions is, is important in terms of designing your program. Um, field work, if someone is not institutionalized and they have some form of mental illness, presumably they're at less of risk of hurting themselves or others. 
but when a healthcare worker has to go out and um, make a visit in a home for someone who might actually need to be committed to a hospital, that is a very risky situation, and that is a situation where you might not want to send somebody alone. And you want to make sure that you have um, some sort of device available to them to summons help when they need it. So there are distinctions. The 2015 um, OSHA gold guidelines were revised to discuss these different st settings. Um, so having made some comments about the distinction across settings, the similarities that I have seen is, you know, there's poor safety culture everywhere. Um, we're seeing sicker patients and clients everywhere. We're seeing increases in substance abuse, whether we're talking about, you know, an institutional or community setting. Um, firearms are more available. Staffing is a problem. And then I really haven't commented on this final point, which is, um, we certainly needed to move away from um, the historical relationship between um, the way we treated the men mentally ill or developmentally disabled individuals with those conditions. But now, in my experience, the pendulum has really swung the other way. And it's all about customer service. And it's all about these, you know, uh, customer, or, I mean, um, patient satisfaction, family satisfaction. And I hear from healthcare workers that you know, their their lives are really dictated by these evaluation forms that are completed, and, and that limits their ability to speak up and also, um, you know, not tolerate the kind of behavior that they're often subjected to. Um, so up until this point, I've talked a lot, I've shown slides about data, but um, these three individuals were all, um, community-based health, uh, mental health care providers that were all murdered in the course of doing their work. So, um, the, actually in the, <coughs> this is Marty Smith. Those of you in Washington State might remember when Marty um, was killed. He was an intensive case manager and went out to do a home visit to assess a young male about being, um, involuntarily hospitalized, he was murdered. And we actually, uh, the group of us at the University of Maryland had the opportunity to come out here for a week and do some field research around that, which subsequently ended up in the passage of some, some laws around protecting community mental health workers, Marty Smith Law. And then uh, Judy Scanlon had a similar experience. She was from New York State, and she was sort of the impetus for the work that I did for about 10 years in New York State with the um, Public Employee Federation there. And then it's just worth noting that um, Wayne Fenton was the, um, he was like the deputy director of one of the divisions within the NIH's um, um, Institute for Mental Health. And he was a schizophrenic expert <coughs> and he, did a favor for a friend, seeing the friend's son on a Sunday afternoon in his office. And by the time the dad came to pick up his son, Artie had been bludgeoned. I mean, uh, Wayne had been had been killed. So again, this was a guy that had the utmost expertise. And again, it just speaks about the risk of um, working alone. Um, so this is the front of the, uh, OSHA guidelines that have been, um, I guess, were first published in 93 and subsequently have been revised several times, most recently in 2015. And that talks about the basic elements of um, a workplace violence prevention program, which is really the intervention that all of you should become familiar with and start working with your organizations around. Um, and it's really a process. I mean, in these court cases, I think being asked, well, you know, like, what's the one thing you can do? There is not one thing you can do. You know, again, because it's not an industrial setting. You can't, you know, switch out one hazard for another, a less hazardous chemical or material. It's, it's the patient and the family that are the hazard and the exposure. And so you need this process, and the process again, is built on, you know, management leadership and commitment to trying to reduce the hazard, employee involvement, 
risk analysis and looking at the data and trying to figure out where incidents of workplace violence are occurring and what can be done to eliminate and if not eliminate, reduce future incidents. And then, you know, continuing to look at your data. Training is part of that, but again, not, not sufficient. Um, training, necessary, but not sufficient. <laughs> um, this slide just, you know, includes um, points that should be part of training. Usually training is on um, how to intervene early and verbally de-escalate the situation from getting to a point where there's a physical altercation. Um, and then in high-risk settings, workers are taught and then they have the opportunity to practice actually laying on of hands, you know, self-defense, and then, you know, how to hold a patient that is going off and how to get them to a safe kind of um, environment. Um, really, when we talk about training, it should involve so much more. It should involve, you know, communication and exchange of knowledge around the hazard and opportunities to um, really learn from frontline workers. So um, the literature. What, what we know about um, which interventions or which groups of interventions are effective in preventing workplace violence. Um, it's interesting, this slide, which I created a long time ago, and I haven't really, um, there hasn't been a lot of literature to update this. In the beginning, there was, um, there was, um, much effort looking at the impact of training. And, um, you know, some of this research that was very cross-sectional, they would, you know, look at workers who had received training and who hadn't and what their experience was with workplace violence. Um, training is good. It showed that you should train, but, but again, that's just one element of a program. Um, So anyway, training, um, important, but not in and of itself, um, the whole of what you need to do. There was work looking at um, the importance and benefit of debriefing. Again, we had mis mixed results. There they found uh, you know, a positive impact here. They didn't find an impact. Um, then I have another slide that talks about other strategies. Um, um, as you can see, there, there are pluses and minuses. So um, this one study by um, David Drummond that came out of the VA looked at the impact of flagging the chart of an individual patient or client who had a history of violence. And the VA started doing this, and they showed that over time they were able to reduce incidents from this patient population by about 80%. So there's no question that that's an effective strategy. The distinction to be made is though the VA is a closed system where you know who's coming in and out, and most other healthcare systems aren't. Now with electronic medical records, there's more of an opportunity to sort of track patients throughout a system. But, um, you know, this was one of the individual um, interventions that just looked at, at one particular uh, strategy and found that it was very um, impactful. Um, a number of us, actually, David Moore was at, is at the VA too, and uh, this was the work that we did in um, New York State. And we, we, I labeled these positive and negative because we found that um, when we worked to implement a comprehensive program, as I've described and are described by the OSHA guidelines in partnership with direct care workers. Workers felt safer, they felt more empowered. We saw the violent incidents fluctuate a lot, so it was sort of positive and negative. We weren't really prepared, though, to be able to use the data that the system collected because as outsiders, we didn't really have access to that. We were working with the union. Um, Judy Arnaz here, um, she, and her team at Wayne State University have, in fact, been able to 
work within a system of, they have seven hospitals there. Mm -hmm. And this last year, they published the first results of a randomized clinical trial that actually looked at the impact of a program that was participatory in nature and data driven and left up to <coughs> the units to craft the types of interventions that were required or would be most impactful in individual high risk units. So um, for any of you that wanna look at the literature, I advise you to look at, there was two publications that came out um, based on that work in 2017, and they do a really nice review of the literature. Um, and again, they actually, they, they collected three years of surveillance data, and then based on the data, they were able to identify which were the high-risk units, and then they looked only at high-risk units, and they randomly assigned them either to be part of this intervention or usable care. And what they found was in the six months following the intervention, there was a significant decrease in all events of violence in the intervention facilities. That decrease wasn't sustained over the 24 month follow-up period, but they did found that, find that at 24 months, two years out, there was actually a statistically significant decrease of about 50% when it came to staff injuries in the intervention units. So again, just recognizing how difficult it is to do this work. This really was eloquent, um, elegantly done and I think is the kind of evidence we need to really demonstrate that what I think is a very <coughs> common sense approach, the OSHA guidelines, work in a uh, uh, comprehensive <coughs> workplace violence prevention program it does in fact have an impact. Um, here's a little bit more detail about it. Um, again, they, they assigned um, 21 units to be intervention facilities. Um, again, at, at six and 24 months, they found reductions by those large percentages and they concluded that a data-driven worksite-based intervention was effective in reducing violence. So um, I'm gonna go through the next couple slides pretty quickly because I think I've said a lot of this. Again, strat the strategy for preventing workplace violence in high risk settings is this process, which is referred to as a workplace violence prevention program based on you know, a, a continuous process improvement <coughs> plan. A um, point that I haven't made is, again, underreporting is a huge problem. It is really reinforced by an, an environment, a system which blames workers for these assaults. And I can't tell you how many um, accident reports that I've reviewed as part of these OSHA cases, and when I look at what the corrective actions are, it's all retraining. You know, that worker should have known that this patient, you know, was impulsive. And that doesn't, you know, that doesn't get you to your goals. So um, really trying to correct the culture so that um, those of you in healthcare, I hope have seen the whole um, area of medical errors really turn around because these principles have been applied there. You know, following this Institute of Medicine report about the number of people who died because of medical errors, there was a real attempt to to create an environment where people were encouraged to come forward with near misses and and accidents and the same thing needs to happen here around worker health and safety i've mentioned um staffing i think i've mentioned the importance of having um, direct worker input um, and leadership um, so finally um, some of the challenges again i come back to this point about a, a culture where um, workplace violence is considered part of the job. Um, so it'll be interesting hearing from any of you that work in behavioral health. Um, my experience has been this, this predominant um, culture that, that the problem 
completely sits with the clinical management of patients, psychiatric patients. And if a worker gets assaulted, you know, we need to go back and look at whether or not the, you know, the individual behavioral plan was correct, if we, you know, had documented their triggers correctly, and we knew what their calming mechanisms were. And, you know, that's such a limited way to look at the problem, because there are system level risk factors when an organization has a lot of health and safety problems. So just focusing on the clinical management of the patient is is very short-sighted. And I'm not a mental health practitioner, so I don't in any way ever mean to suggest that what a behavioral health organization is doing is not good clinical practice. But if they're having a large number of workers that are being assaulted and off work, obviously the clinical management isn't sufficient, right? And why an organization would look to the discipline of occupational health and safety or public health and try to augment what they're doing clinically with this other set of you know strategies is unclear to me. So um, third, um, challenge again is just many, many um, <coughs> employers think they should just train the problem away. Uh, I mentioned uh, <coughs> blaming the victim, lack of recognition of staff expertise, and then staffing. So, what do we do? Um, besides the work I did with OSHA, I think all of the access I've had to workplaces um, around the hazard workplace violence has been through um, organized labor. So certainly if you're fortunate enough to work in an organization where there's a collective bargaining agreement, you need to work closely with them. Um, and if you're a union that has health care as some of your, your rank and file, you definitely need to be focusing on workplace violence because it's a really important problem. Um, join labor management, work, uh, health and safety committees in general, and I'd say one that, again, if, if workplace violence is you know one of your biggest hazards, that should be the primary focus of the health and safety discussions. Um, contract language is important. Um, again, I'll be anxious to hear from folks in California who now have a workplace violence regulation, and certainly Washington State has a regulation. Maryland has a regulation. Workers aren't really empowered, perhaps not knowledgeable about it. They're not empowered to file a complaint. Um, and many state agencies that have the authority to investigate the complaint are not really you know, funded or equipped to do so. Um, you know, another strategy, and we did this in Washington State after Marty Smith's death, was um, was actually the um, Service Employees International, used to be 1199 Northwest, the union that, that invited myself and my colleagues out to Seattle following Marty's death to do this field work. And we, we did um, you know, meetings and focus groups with groups of workers um, in all kinds of different constituencies, but the one thing that we did, which was so enlightened, is they had us meet with um, individuals that were from uh, NAMI, NAMI, the um, the families of individuals with mental illness, and to talk to them really, you know, enhanced my understanding of the problem. And so I think it's a very strong and vocal group, and certainly individuals that I know who have family members or have family members that are hospitalized and because of the experience of hospitalization and the meds and the anesthesia, they could become violent. No one wants their family member to be a perpetrator of violence. So you need to work with um, groups just outside of, of health and safety, I think, to really make advances in this area and, and use the media. So um, I'm not really gonna say much about um, on the policy level, um, Nancy mentioned there, there are at least uh, 10 states that have passed workplace violence prevention laws. The most, um, I think, uh, aggressive and successful ones are those that really spell out the requirements of a, a comprehensive 
Worker Health and Safety Program, New York State, certainly the California regulation, you know, specifically talks about um, employee involvement and health and safety committees. Um, federal OSHA is inspecting workplaces. There is no federal standard around workplace violence prevention, but they use their general duty clause, which states that employers have a responsibility to provide a workplace that's free from recognized hazards. And since workplace violence is really a recognized hazard in, in healthcare and has been for decades now, um, Federal OSHA is responding to complaints from workers and knowing it and citing and fining employers. Um, there was a petition for a, a federal standard in 2016, which you know, following the um, the general election, well, it went on the back burner. I actually have been contacted by um, staff, uh, congressional staff, about maybe trying to reintroduce something, a law, actually after the midterm elections. So we'll see what happens there. So, um, just really quickly, this is um, <laughs> this slide just um, talks about the number of. Um, federal OSHA inspections um, that have gone on over the last uh, 10 plus years. Um, this slide just basically says that even when you can get a worker to file a complaint, a very few amount of them actually get citations. So as you can see over time, the number of complaints has increased and the proportion of those complaints that end up as actual citations is still rather small. Um, and then finally, this is this is the link to that um, e-tool that I mentioned that I, I find really useful. Um, I keep going back to it to remember what were some of these specific best practices that were identified across workplace settings. So um, easier thing to do is just Google um, OSHA workplace violence. It's specific to hospitals, but a lot of the principles are. Generic. So I think that's, here are some additional resources. Are these slides available to participants? Yeah, the slide decks are going to be on that course resource page that you were emailed out last night, and it's also at the very top link that's on your agenda handout as well. Okay, and I have nine o'clock <laughs> precisely. So I really would like to hear from. Um, <laughs> Any of you questions, comments, personal experiences? Yeah. So I was going to go play to it for second hard on the motor chair. One of the things we're up against all the time is either the staff gets assaulted. Can, every, can everyone hear it? No. Okay. You know what? This we could probably give you this, right? It's going to be corded, so maybe the microphone that's on your person would oh. be a little easier. Okay, perfect. I work at Sacred Heart Adult Psych Unit, and one of the things that we come up against continually is if staff is assaulted by a patient, and then we press charges, and then that patient is taken by police to the jail, they are there for 24 hours, and then released, and then back in our ED. And it's just a vicious circle, and then it gets, you know, issues come up whether we need to take that patient back or we want to take that patient back. Or where do they go if we don't take them? What is, I mean, what is your recommendation in terms of I don't what know can be we, done better? I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. The, the other thing that we come up against, too, is that we press charges against somebody, and then it is goes to prosecution, then that patient is able to find out exactly who you are and probably your address and that type of thing. And that's not safe either. So we don't. We haven't come up with a solution. I mean, I hear from a lot of workers that uh, hear these same comments, but also that um, they press charges and basically law enforcement or the district attorney like laughs at them, like, well, what do you mean? Again, you work, you know, in a psych hospital. This is just part of the job. The person is there because they have these behaviors. And so one thing that we advise is to 
begin, if you haven't already, a relationship with local law enforcement and get down to, you know, shadow a healthcare worker for a day because they bring in this individual, usually in handcuffs, and there's a couple of them, and then basically they transfer them to an individual healthcare worker who doesn't have any of those kinds of protections. We'll even get them from jail. And some of the comments on the ED notes is that they're too combative for jail. Wow. <laughs> I mean, again, this is, you know, there are no quick fixes to many of these problems. But again, I think to document that, I mean, this is why the media comes in. You know, the, the public doesn't know a lot about your experience and to find ways to educate the public and lawmakers and criminal justice about this problem and, you know, see if there are better strategies. But that's, I mean, that's really hard, this part of the continuum. So we'll work on it see if we can work on something. Anybody else have any comments about that particular issue? Again, in, um, in um, the state of Massachusetts, actually, there is a report out of work that was done with the district attorney's office. With the district attorney's office, just trying to, again, make sure that law enforcement isn't a big, big part of the problem. And, you know, work in collaboration again. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to present later on about what we've been doing in Oregon with the sandwich state between Washington and California. And we have a law, <laughs> in case you don't know. Um, and we've been doing quite a lot of work in the last two years. So a couple of things. Um, the rural hospitals in Washington and Oregon, we hold patients in the ED for 48 hours or more because there's nowhere to send them. And in some cases, that's half the law enforcement of that town that are in the local hospital ED watching the patient. In one case, in La Grande in Eastern Oregon, they have two police on at one time. One of them is usually in the DED because there's nowhere to send the behavioral health psych patients because we've closed all those facilities on the eastern side of the state. And it's the same in Washington. So this law enforcement relationship is huge. We're talking about what we can do with the district attorneys in Oregon um, because we have to approach this. Uh, we're working with the unions and the hospital association from a state legislative perspective. And there's a lot of education to be done with our legislatures. Uh, um, our state representatives. And then on the public health side, British Columbia in 2009, I think, did a very good public health campaign across all healthcare um, environments to educate the public that it's not okay to abuse healthcare workers. Australia has done an excellent campaign. There's some great videos if anyone wants links to them. We're going to try and get funding to do that in Oregon so people can share that um, because we feel that the public are treating healthcare workers like it's a hotel business. Mm -hmm. um, it is not just behavioral health. Right. Um, so, and, and I just have to comment um, on the clinical root cause analysis and looking at the clinical side of solving a problem in behavioral health. We have the opposite problem with things like ICU delirium, where we, we don't look at, we don't ask the questions of clinicians about how to manage that patient in a better way. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was an interesting kind of dichotomy we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's really important to not only look at what's happening in another state, but also I know Canada, British Columbia in yeah. particular, and Australia is way ahead of us. Now, of course, there are different kind of statutory <laughs> issues and firearms and things, but still, um, I look forward to learning more about that. Oops. I really have a question and a comment. Um, I know um, in our organization, Frontier Behavioral Health, we have um, aligned with the um, police department where we do CIT training. I don't know if you've heard of the crisis intervention training where every single police officer, is, um, they have committed to 40 hours of training um, with our organization and we take them through everything that we can expose them to. Um, they come through our three inpatient units. They um, go out in the field, they are trained on how to recognize certain symptoms and things like that. So we have a partnership with them. And our three inpatient units, we do not have security. We are, um, you know, EMTs and, you know, just the funding doesn't um, support that level of security. But um, we do um, rely on the um, police officers to come when we need them to come. Our um, incident of staff, 
um, assault is very low, although we do not do seclude, restrain, or force medications in our um, facilities. Um, and my partners, Sacred Heart, they do assist us in that piece. Um, so we do manage it in that way. Um, we look at what is reasonable for our um, inpatient facilities, the structure of the units, um, uh, what we have um, when you only have five staff on, and you go to put hands on, that's not a good place to be. And so I, I think just looking at what can, um, what can you do in your facility, what streets will do, what's, what's um, the safest thing to do, looking at um, all those things in, in partnership, that's what we did with the police department in helping us to then um, take those um, patients out of our facility when it's at a level where we've done everything that we can, um, de-escalation, you know, all those kinds of things that, that we're trained to do um, to assist that person in managing the behavior when it comes to a point where it's not manageable, then, then we do um, rely upon the police department to help us take them to another ED. Wow, you have a lot of experience. Let me ask you, so are you in management? I am the director of nursing. Mm -hmm. I'm at Frontier. Yeah. Okay. So were you the impetus for this approach? No, it was just a an approach that, um, as far as working with the police department, when I just, um, just overall, it's just not like overall. Already enlightened, you know, um, approach. Um, yes, I was the impetus for not for the inpatient units. Okay. Um, as far as working with the police department, that just came as a collaborative mm -hmm. effort. Um, but yes, I was the impetus for our inpatient units and how we then approach um, the uh, patient that we are unable to then manage the behavior in a, in a way that's safe for them and safe for the others and safe for the staff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying we've never had any right, instance right. of, but it's pretty low mm -hmm. um, for our inpatient units. Um, so, yeah. again, I just think this is yeah. this is an example yeah. where you've got enlightened leadership. Well, and also too, I worked 27 years at my partner Sacred Heart in yeah. adult psych, so I had a lot of experience there as well. So that I brought that with me. I'll just to speak a second on uh, a personal observation being the manager of one of the inpatient units at Frontier Behavioral Health. Uh, having been in very, very uh, intensive inpatient psychiatric, and now what I call psych light, uh -huh. which is uh, we don't have the seclusion, we don't have the restraints. Um, what, what I have found in our almost non-existent assaults um, are partially internal in a in a bigger system with seclusion and restraints when somebody is acting out you tend to say stop it or you're going to wind up in seclusion or restraints and that's an invitation at our place we say stop it you're scaring us mm -hmm. and we get everybody else to a safe place but the confrontation is not there and without the confrontation um, they tend, I think they tend to respond a lot better with, uh, with you know, more, more of a feeling based than a consequence based uh, approach to what's about to happen to them. I you mean, know. there's no question that restraints and seclusion, you know, are part of the problem and that that's how people get injured. But, I mean, can you just speak to the topic of staffing? Because I think those are so, you know, intermingled that, you know, you, you can't, I mean, I hear from workers that they don't have the opportunity to do therapeutic interventions and, you know, practice these skills that they've been given because, you know, they're sort of running, they're, they're running a group at the same time that they're doing 15 minute checks. And again, um, you know, maybe that's just a real low road employer and there's nothing you can do, but. You know, even in busy times at, at our facilities, we, we make the environment around the person safe first. Mm -hmm. And it gives everybody time. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's something going on and somebody is acting out, then we, we tend not to seclude the person, we tend to get everybody else safe. Mm -hmm. We ask them to clear the halls and wait in their rooms uh, until you know until it's passed or until it's been dealt with. 
but uh, I just think that uh, you know the <coughs> historically when when there's a lot of brawls going on on your unit mm -hmm. there tends to be some staff who like to brawl mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, I mean, and, it does go both ways yeah and we sure. and we we're, we're not you know in, in our our culture is just uh, more that it's something we don't do, so we have to work on something else mm -hmm. as a solution. Mm -hmm. And we just shelter in place and call the cops mm -hmm. if it gets that bad. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments? Great. Um, oh, just Thank real you. quick, you had, you had asked about staffing. <clears throat> Mike is one of my managers. <coughs> Sorry about my voice, is really gravelly. Um, but we have uh, two nurses and three techs on. Um, we Are also. Um, 16 on each unit. We have three units and only 16 because it's, it's an ENT. So we can only have uh, 16 beds in a community-based ENT. Um, and so we also have uh, we have um, engaged peers that do our groups, um, assistance one-on-ones, and I have clinicians, our mass repairs who also mass repaired staff who also then engage in the one-to-ones as well as do discharge planning. So my frontline staff, so to speak, are not happy to do the groups. Um, and then trying to pass meds and do the Q checks and all of those. So we've kind of managed it that way. So we have the staff that are out on the floor. Um, and yes, we do have staffing issues when you're short staff, people call in, things like that. But I think in managing it that way, we're not expecting the staff to then, like the nurses to run groups and things like that. Then you can um, not have that sense of um, where people are spread too thin. Okay, anybody want to Questions? So um, I'm one of the employee health nurses at a regional health system in Oregon and what we're seeing and this may be an issue of how we report things so I would be curious dumped into the bucket for workplace violence are also those incidents that are happening on the floors our medical floors our ICU floors Linda sort of alluded to this with the ICU psychoses but we, um, we, we've been seeing a lot of reported injuries associated with individuals who have dementia of some sort, and they kind of tend to get bucketed right in with the behavioral health um, patients who are exhibiting different behaviors. And so I would be curious if you're looking at these differently in your systems or if they are also sort of bucketed. I guess I'm trying to find out if we should be peeling those off as a separate animal. Well, I mean, I would just react that, I mean, they're all workplace violence. Again, this sort of gets, I mean, the intent is not an issue in behavioral health or, you know, in maybe geriatric dementia units. I think what you need to do is you need to, you know, count incidents, but you need to look at where they're happening. And then with, Workplace violence, there's not one size fits all, so I think the interventions are going to be different. The strategies are going to be different based on, you know, the patient population. And um, I would imagine there's probably a fair amount of overlap between, you know, a psych unit and maybe a Jerry, you know, dementia unit. Um, but I would consider them all workplace violence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for starting off the morning. Great. Our next presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Rosenman. She's assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Washington, where she is the director of simulations. She uses simulation to train teamwork and communication skills to students and licensed providers including a curriculum for training conflict management and de-escalation skills to emergency medicine residents. Her research efforts focus on teamwork and team performance in emergency medicine teams, and she's a co-investigator on grants funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and the Department of Defense. This is the SHIP grant that we um, were able to get this past year, and um, we also, I want to acknowledge um, Dr. Marie Bravelick. She's one of the other co-investigators of this project in the PI, actually, and um, and she has been leading the, the actual study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 